appreciate this <clears throat> early. Thank you for praying for us. And uh, this morning, if you've got your Bibles with you, I'm going to turn to uh, a few passages of Scripture. Um, I want to start out in Mark chapter 5 and verse 6, and then we'll turn to Hebrews. And uh, and just look at a few verses. Then I'll, I've got several uh, jotted down, so we'll just uh, we'll go through them. But I'll, I'll call them out, but we'll have to turn to all of them. Mark chapter 5 and uh, verse 6. Very, a pretty familiar passage of scripture here, the maniac in the tombs uh, is the one that we're dealing with. But in Mark chapter 5 and verse 6, the Bible says, uh, but when he saw Jesus so far off, he ran and worshiped him. And so uh, what I want to, the thought I want to deal with this morning or the, the, just to the, the touch for devotion wise is, have you seen him? Amen. Have you seen him? The Bible says there in that verse that when he saw him afar off, amen, uh, that's the way most people see him as afar off, amen, but if you really get a glimpse of who he is and what he is, amen, uh, he, he said that if we draw nigh unto him, he would draw nigh unto us, amen. And we see that in Romans chapter, or excuse me, not Romans, in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses uh, 2 and 3, let me back up to take verse 1 into consideration. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also compassed about with great, uh, such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and that sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run the patience the race that is set before us. And it says in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such, con such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. And we see that's happening a lot in our <coughs> churches and, and uh, in uh, places that we minister to so many people that are fainting because of what they're seeing. So many people that are fainting uh, in their minds, amen, because they're overwhelmed with the circumstances that are around us. And most of the time we faint because we are not looking at Jesus. I mean, we get to looking at the surroundings. We get to looking at the circumstances. Uh, kind of like when Peter said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee. And he stepped out of the ship and stepped on the water and began to walk on water until he saw the winds and the waves boisterous, and he began to sink. And so that's the, typically where we are today, amen, in our lives, in our walk, amen. We do good as long as we keep our eyes on him, amen. And so uh, have you seen him, amen? Uh, if, if, if I were to come past you today, brother, and say, have you seen him? Uh could you tell me where he's at or which way he went, amen? If you ha if you hadn't had your eyes on him recently, you couldn't tell me, amen? Well, he came through here yesterday. I know he did. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but have you seen him, amen? There would be such a walk. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all our sins, amen? And so if we've got the relationship that we should have, and, and I were to come up and ask you, hey, have you seen him? Oh, yeah, man, he's just right here. <laughs> you know, if our walk is right, if our hearts are where they should be, if, if we have the relationship that God would have us to have, amen, uh, the Bible says that we're to be ready to give every man an answer of that hope that lieth within us, amen? And uh, you can't do that if you don't have that walk with him on a daily basis. If you're not where God would have you to be, uh, then we can't answer. We're not readily to answer, amen. Uh, we've, got, we've got to think and, and no, just contemplate and, 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 and then try to come up. But if you've got that walk with him, amen, uh, man, you right off the tip of your tongue, it's there, amen. You can share what God's doing, where he is, what he's doing, what he's accomplishing. You can share where he's taking you, amen. And so... First thing I want to see this morning in the question, have you seen him? And uh, I trust that everybody here has seen this. Uh, have you seen him as the sinner seeker? Amen. That's where, I, that's where I saw him first. Amen. When he sought me out, the Bible says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. I'm glad I can say this morning, now for uh, many years of my life, from the age of seven to 27, I said, oh yeah, I've seen him. Yeah. No, I'm saved, you know, I'm on my way to heaven, but uh, it wasn't true. I had I had uh, shook a preacher's hand, I'd gotten baptized, I'd joined the church at the age of seven, but I wasn't saved until the age of 27. Mm -hmm. And that's when I saw him, amen. Uh, and Rock of Ages people know this, but when I was 27 years old, uh, we moved our uh, membership 
Uh, my wife and I did to uh, uh, Brownsburg Baptist Church, but Steve Jarrett was a pastor. Went forward on a Sunday morning, said, hey, we want to join the church here. He met with us on Sunday night. He said, uh, you've been out of church for a while. They do you good to go through this little booklet. And uh, Brother Gurley, it was a booklet printed by the Rock of Ages Ministries. <laughs> December, the, uh, uh, third, December the 10th of this year, would be 41 years ago. And he said, it do you good to go through this book, a chapter each night, you and your wife together. And uh, so we started through it. It's called, I Just Got Saved, What's Next? And it's a booklet that uh, a preacher in West Virginia had written, uh, just a small booklet about the size of that song book. And uh, first night went through it, second night went through it, Thursday night we was going through the chapter on what took place when you got saved, what God did, what you did. And, and like I had during the 20 years from 7 to 27, I'd gone to churches, come under conviction, go forward, I'd rededicate my life, I'd, I'd get up and do better for a few days, be right back to my old ways. But uh, never a change, never a lasting change. And then on that night, December the 10th, 1981, we finished that chapter and Debbie said, I'm tired, I'm going on to bed. And I said, well, I'm tired, but I'm gonna read some of them verses again. God was working on my heart. And I went through some of those verses again and I come under conviction. And I, I, I looked and I said, God, I'm sick and tired of how my life has been. I'm sick and tired of the way it's going. And God, I want, I want to rededicate my life to you. And Brother Gurley, I didn't, I did not hear, and I, I may have shared this there at New Hebrew, and I don't remember if I have or not, but uh, I didn't hear a voice, but you know what I'm saying, when I, the Lord spoke to my heart, I, I didn't hear an audible voice, but in my heart it was as real as if somebody had said something. It's so real, I looked to the side and said, do what? Because when I said, I want to rededicate my life, the Lord said, how can you rededicate something you've never dedicated? And it, it, it shook me. I said, Lord, what? You know, and nobody's there. I'm reading the verses again. And, and God let me remember that morning as a seven-year-old boy, just as clear as if it had been this morning. And I took the preacher by the hand, Pastor Sharp in Southern Baptist Church. And, and I said, uh, he said, son, would you like to be saved? I said, yes, sir. He said, we'll baptize you Sunday night. And that's all that transpired. And for the first time in my life, at the age of 27, standing behind our kitchen table in the corner, of our kitchen. I said, God, I'm lost. For the first time in my life, I realized it. But see, it wasn't me seeking him. It was him seeking me out. Amen. It's he that came to, uh, to seek and to save that which was lost. And I bowed my head that night and I asked God to forgive me. And, and I wasn't concerned about hell. Hell was not my concern. I wanted forgiveness. I wanted to be forgiven for what I was, a sinner. I wanted to be forgiven what I was, an enemy of God and enmity with God, against God, amen. And and God that and I'd ask preachers this all the time in prison. I'd say, if you if somebody out there would forgive you, how many of you could do your time a whole lot easier? Hands would go up all over the room, amen. It's forgiveness that makes the difference. Uh so many people they want to get saved just so I don't have to go to hell. I didn't honestly I didn't care where God sent me. I knew if he sent me there, he's going with me, amen. So it's going to be okay. So I wasn't concerned about a destination. I was concerned about right now the forgiveness of who I was and what I was. And God forgave me that night and saved me. As a result, hell's, hell's not in my future no more, amen. But the forgiveness is what I wanted. And that's where God gave the fellowship. That's where God gave the change, amen. So have you seen him as the center seeker? And then secondly, have you seen him as a sympathetic savior? Well, I tell you what, nobody's cared for my soul like him. The difference that he makes. Uh, I had a mama that loved me. Uh, I got a wife that loves me. But none of them match the love of my savior, amen? And there's days I can go, I could go to my mom and tell her my problems and it just kind of like water off a duck's back, amen? She had greater problems to deal with than mine. Mine didn't seem so uh, so big or so important to her. Uh, I can go to my wife sometimes and with a problem. She said, just grow up. <laughs> no, she don't really. Uh, she's always telling me that mercy is not my strong point. Uh, when, but I got a brag on her when I had my knee replacement four months ago. Uh, she was... She, man, she overcome that. She was very merciful. But then when I got to where I could get up and be doing for myself, she said, get over it now, big boy. No, <laughs> no it, uh, the sympathy of our Savior. 
Well, the Bible says in, in uh, 2 Peter, or 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, I, I've never taken anything to the Lord, Brother Gurley, and, and God said, why are you bothering me with that? Man, that is so insignificant. That's so, I mean, that's got you shook up? God's never done that to me. I can take the smallest or the greatest of things to him. And when I go to him and if I confess my sin, the Bible says if I regard, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But if I go to him and, and I have made, made bare my soul to him, I've poured out my heart to him. He said, you ask what you will. Casting all your cares upon him. Thank God for a sympathetic Savior, amen? And I think if you're saved here this morning, you've seen him as that, amen? But no, sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we need to be reminded that, hey, we've got one that cares like nobody else ever has, amen? I know sometimes uh, we probably have all been through times when we've prayed, when we've been going through a valley, and we're thinking, man, is the Lord hearing? <laughs> been there? <laughs> is the Lord hearing? Does the Lord care? He does. But sometimes it's just like we are with our children. We let them learn some things, a little bit of like the school of hard knocks. We let them, we let them experience some things because we've told them, we've warned them, and all these things. We've told them over and over again, that's hot, that's hot. Now, you wouldn't let them stick their hands onto something that's going to just, I mean, burn them up. But you'll let them touch something that will burn them just a little bit, just enough to realize what hot he is, to listen to mom and dad when you say it again. And sometimes that sympathetic savior because of his great love wherewith he loved us, will allow us to go through some valleys sometimes, will allow us to go through some trials, will allow us to go through some hardships sometimes, just so that we realize that he cares for us. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 36 through 38, but when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted, were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. You realize the only prayer request the Lord ever gave is pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. Well, he, he cares so much about you. He cares so much about the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He cares so much about the world that he even made it a prayer request to you and I that we would be concerned with what he's concerned with. Amen. That's a sympathetic Savior. Sympathetic means he's, he's in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. That's why he can be our high priest. and That's why he, he can do so much for us. Amen. Because he knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're faced with. Amen. Uh, and he knows how to overcome it, amen? And that's why he gives us uh, scripture to tell us, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And our time is gone this morning. Uh, Lord willing, if we get a chance to stand before you again, we may share it the rest of it, amen? Miss Debbie.